Today, I want to teach you, you know, based on the principles what we have learned, I want to teach you how to apply everything that we have been learning, how to put it to practice. We have gotten the principles of faith. We have gotten the foundations of faith. We have learned the origins of faith. We have learned what faith is not. And uh, now we need to learn how to apply that which we have received. The word says that to whom much is given, much is required. So today, I want to teach on how to apply your faith, all right? So I want to share this with you. You know, there are many things that I have had to apply my faith for in my whole life, all right? And the most important and meaningful, meaningful things that I have had to believe in are for others. It is for other people. Why? Because our faith was not given to us just for ourselves, we could appropriate ourselves of everything that Jesus did for us at the cross, right? But the faith that God has given us is for the body of Christ, first and foremost. So the most important and meaningful things that I have had to believe for are for others. It's a blessing to be a blessing to someone else. You know you are blessed when others are blessed by you and through you, amen, because you cannot give what you don't have. So that's the most important and meaningful things that I have had to believe it is for others. Now, the hardest thing that I had to have faith for was for my calling, and it had, not, had it not been for my obedience to the call of God over my life, I would not have been able to in turn believe for others. Think about that. If you do not obey the call of God over your life, how then would you be able to be a blessing to others? How then would you be able to have faith for others, to see others set free, to see others healed, to see others delivered, to see others blessed? Amen. Are you with me, church? See, the enemy and God know how many lives God can change through you. The devil knows and God knows that if you were to have faith and apply your faith, the devil knows and God knows how many people he can impact through your life. And that's why it has been one of the hardest things because the devil will do whatever he can in order to prevent you from accomplishing that. He'll, do, he'll throw any obstacle he can in order to prevent you from having faith for yourself and having faith for others. Are you with me? So he wants to do whatever he can for you to throw in the towel, but God will do everything he can for you to persevere in your faith. Romans 1, 16 through 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek next. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What is it that the just shall live by? How many, how many just people are in this place today? How many righteous people do we have in this building? The just shall live by faith. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So see, God has called us to live by faith, and it is impossible for us to please him without it. Faith is like the breath of life for every believer. We cannot live without faith if we are called disciples of Jesus. We cannot say that we have faith in God and, and be able to thrive without faith. If we don't have it, you, it's like you're spiritually dead. So for every believer... Faith is, our, is like our, the breath of life in order for you to spiritually thrive. Are you with me? When you do not live by faith, you will be spiritually dead. So Romans 12.3 says that God has given each one of us a measure of faith. Therefore, no one has an excuse 
that they do not have faith. Everybody has faith. You need faith for everything. Even the non-believers need to believe in something that, that, in something that is so, I would say, incredible to believe. Even atheists, for you to believe, for you to believe that something was made out of nothing, you must have more faith than a Christian does. It requires a lot of faith to believe that something is made from nothing, right? So everyone has a measure of faith, even non-believers. A non-believer has to have the faith that if they want to become a doctor, that they have to go through a rigorous process of education in order to acquire a doctorate. They have to have faith. They have to, everybody has a measure of faith. And there's diff three different types of faith, though. There's faith in God, there's faith in the Word of God, and there's faith in the works of God. Okay, so not everyone has faith in God, faith in the Word of God, and faith in the works of God. Okay, so today we want to study what does it mean to, when we say that we shall live by faith. In this word, the, in this verse, the, the word shall live comes from the Greek word kaya, which means to enjoy life or live happily. The definition goes even further than that, okay? It also means to flourish. It means to exist. It means to breathe. It means to be of good cheer. It means to recover one's health and to live without hindrances. It means to be slaved. It means to do everything that you do, you know, as you live, sleep, eat, okay? It means to prosper. It means to worship. It means to work, to tithe, and to give offerings. Everything that it requires for you to live by faith, that's what live by means. Are you with me? So to live means, it means to live prosper prosperously, to live forever to be quickened, to be alive, to be restored to life, and to be restored to health. This is how God has called us to live. So basically, the main idea produced by the word kaya is concentrated in two verbs. It is concentrated in live and breathe. And therefore, what this verse is really saying, according to Hebrew culture, is that if we choose to live without faith, we are not living at all. If the righteous shall live by faith, when we don't live by faith, we are not living how God intended to us to live. If you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, if you call yourself a believer, if you don't live by faith, you are not living how God intended for you to live. Are you with me? So faith is the element that gives us the strength to overcome difficulties, to overcome problems, to overcome crisis, and to overcome adversity. When we exercise our faith, we bear the evidence of the life that is within us. And we are implicitly telling the world that we will not give up. That we will not throw in the towel. There's only two ways to live. You can only live by faith or live by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. All right, so those are the two type of ways to live. What does sight represent? Sight represents, it means uh, to live and be guided by our natural senses. Whether it is what we see, whether it is what we hear, whether it is what we smell, touch, or taste. When we walk by sight, we are totally depending on our own capabilities. When we live by faith, we are putting our dependency completely on God. How many of you over here know what it's like to put your dependency on God? How many of you know what it's like to have that something that, that is so out of your control that you have no other option than to believe in he who is greater than you? How many?
many of you here could say, I have lived through some moments in my life where if it wasn't my, on me depending on God, I would not have a roof over my head. I would not have a way to get to work. I would not have a vehicle if I didn't put my dependency on God. I would not have been able to overcome that sickness if I didn't depend on God. How many hop leaders are here today? I remember when they first told me two months of being reconciled with God. My mentor said, uh, in one month, you're going to open up a house of peace. I was two months in. I remember that day. I said, my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, I don't know how to pray the sinner's prayer. I have never led somebody to Christ. The only thing about I know about the Bible is that Samson was deceived by Delilah, that Jonah got swallowed by a whale. The only thing I know is what I learned in Sunday school. I only know that David killed a giant. What am I going to do? I spent that entire month saying, Lord, if I have to depend on my own capability, I said, I'm doomed. I said, but... The righteous shall live by faith, not by sight, not by what I sense, not by how I feel, not by what I lack, not by, not by what I don't know. So I, I said, if I only know one thing that my mother and my father taught me as a child. I grew up in a pastoral family. At eight years old, they were teaching us how to fast. At eight years old, they were teaching us how to abstain from our needs. So I, I remember those days. I remember going to church and spending a day of fasting and praying in the church. And I'm telling my mom, Mom, I'm hungry. There's no food today? What is this fasting stuff? I'm only eight years old. But I remembered. I remembered I remembered and I said, if I cannot depend on my own capability, I said, I must completely depend on God. So you know what I did? I began prayer and fasting. I got, I remember, man, I, I was a drug dealer. I was addicted to drugs. I was a womanizer. I was an adulterer. I was so broken before I came to God. Every Saturday at my house, there, there was a party. And I remember that. They used to say, they used to say in my neighborhood, one time I went to evangelize to a, a Jewish guy. He says, oh, you're the guy from the corner? We call you the drug dealer. Because there's always a party in your house and there's always people coming in and coming out. And I had a bunch of dirty chairs that I would use for partying. And they were dirty because I wasn't using them anymore. Once I came to the Lord, those chairs were just rotting outside. I remember I cleaned those chairs. I put the grease around them, I washed them, and I brought them inside of the house, and I began to prophesy to those chairs. 22 chairs, I remember. There was 22 chairs there, and I said, these chairs will be filled. Whoever sits on these chairs will be healed. They will be delivered. This house will be filled the first day of my house of peace. I said, there's not going to be enough chairs for the amount of people that I'm believing God for. I'm applying my faith, and I'm believing God that I will not have enough clean chairs that people People will have to stand. People will have to sit. I said, Lord, I might not be the best preacher. I might not know the Bible. I might not know how to do a sinner's prayer. But one thing I have is faith. Because the word of God says, the righteous shall live by faith. I couldn't put my focus on what I didn't have. I couldn't put my focus on my own abilities. I had to put my focus on the invisible one. Can I tell you that that day, 30 people showed up to the house. Eight of them had to sit on the floor or stand. It was by faith. Come on now. In Hebrews chapter 11, we see different things men and women of God had to have faith for. Now, we see that by faith, Abel gave to God a more excellent offering than Cain, through which he was found righteous. We see that Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. 
By faith, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place, to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he did not know where he was going. By faith, he followed God. By faith, his wife Sarah bore him a child when she was past the childbearing age. It was by faith that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, not fearing the wrath of the king. And it was by faith that the walls of Jericho fell down after they encircled them for seven days. It was by faith that Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong and they became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of their enemies. It was by faith that they did all these things. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. such as, as in the hall of fame this is the hall of faith this is what these great men and women of god did by faith and today we see these heroes of the faith and we learn what god can do when we live by faith and not by sight today i want to teach you how to apply your faith be it for the things of your everyday life be it if you need to have faith to stand in the gap for others or be it for your calling i had to believe god for my calling and that's something that was very hard for me because i grew up in a pastoral family and at the age of 10 years old my father fell into sin he fell from grace a pastor yes he fell from grace and as a result i went looking for identity in the wrong places or things at the most crucial age because during those teenage years you're looking for identity and my father was gone i identified with him i saw him as my hero and i remember that i started slowly but surely separating myself from god i began to sell weed at a young age in high school i began to smoke i began to drink I began to do a lot of things that I wasn't proud of to such a point that it led me towards a downward spiral. I went from broken relationship to broken relationship. The more I broke up with women, the more insecure I came, the less I trusted, and the deeper I dove into drugs. I began consuming cocaine. I became a drug dealer. I began selling cocaine, selling weed. I took all kinds of drugs. I was so confused and I liked so much identity that I thought I was going to be a rapper. I didn't look like how I look now. If I look like this, nobody would buy my album. <laughs> and I, I, I was so confused. I was doing so many things. I was cutting hair. I was a barber. I was an electrician. I was a rapper. I was going to school to be a lawyer, I suppose, so I could get myself out of jail. <laughs> so broken and so lost, so confused. And I remember at the age of 18, we had a prophet in my family in Nicaragua. And at, one day my mother went to Nicaragua and God spoke through that prophet, through my aunt, and he said, tell your son, Gerald, that if he serves me, I will grant him all the desires of his heart, whatever his heart desires. And I said, I was 18 at that time. And I said, wow, God wants to make a deal with me? And then I started thinking about what I wanted, what my heart desired. <laughs> and... I said, wait, wait a minute. I desire to be a famous rapper. And what I want to rap about is far from Christ-like. <laughs> so I doubt that God wants to give me what I want. And I'm sure there was other desires there that I had never spoken about, you know. 
Well, that was what came to my head. And I said, God, thank you, but no thank you. I'm good. And I remember that I just kept on going. And I just became more addicted, more lost, more confused. I felt hopeless. I had a great job. I worked 16 years in banking before I came to work at the church. I would, I would make good money at a young age. But I squandered it all like the prodigal son that I was. I squandered it all. Because sin is very expensive. And when I came to the Lord, I had nothing to show for my sin. So at the age of 26, I heard that my father came back to the Lord. And I told my brother, I don't believe it. I've seen this before. As a matter of fact, I had told God, not even God could change my father because of how many chances my mother gave him and how many times he tried to come to church after. I had said, not even God could change my, my dad. So when I heard that God changed my father, that touched me. And I said, if God delivered my father, he could deliver me too. And I said, if, if my dad is back with God, that means God is back in our family. I didn't know what I was saying at that time. I came to learn over here that when the head aligns, the body aligns with it. And I remember that that touched me. And I gave to my life, my life to the Lord as a result. I reconciled with my father. With my natural father and my heavenly father. And God says, you're going to be a preacher. And you know what? I remember that my brother... He was an elder at that time in this church. And he's like, can I pray for you? And I said, yes. It was a, we had a family reunion because God has spoken to my father about our family. And um, I remember that he asked me to pray for me. And at that moment, God began to deliver me. He broke every chain. He broke every shackle. He removed the addiction. He started to heal my heart. 